hello and welcome to the Photo Brigade podcast. I am with my friend Mickey Osterreicher. Did I get your name right this time? You nailed it. Okay, because last time you were on the podcast, this is probably uh, 25, 30 podcasts ago now. I, I just listened to it again, and I did uh, butcher your name a little bit, and I feel bad about it. So um, welcome back to the podcast. It's great to be here. Mickey, uh, for everyone that doesn't know, is the general counsel to the National Press Photographers Association. And um, that means representing, you know, almost 10,000, maybe seven, 8,000. Oh, I, I, I wish it was that high. It's, oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's seven and unfortunately declining. And oh, okay. that's one of the things we want to talk about. So, yeah, uh, I, I've been plugging at the beginning of these podcasts, the National Pre- Press Photographers Association, NPPA, which you can see uh, behind Mickey here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about NPPA and, and why you think, from your perspective, it is such an important sure. organization? It's not just from my perspective. I've been a member since 1973. Uh-huh. And I, even though don't have to as a general counsel, still pay my dues because I am very proud to be an organization that is the voice of visual journalists. Uh-huh. Uh, it, we were formed in 1946, uh, incorporated in New York. Uh, and uh, represent still photographers, video photographers, staffers, independent journalists, editors, students. Uh, And there are so many issues where photographers, visual journalists, are being squeezed on all sides. Mm -hmm. From the access and First Amendment issues to not being able to take photographs and record video to copyright issues where everybody thinks that the internet is the public domain and anything there can be taken and used for free. Right. To contracts, to terms of service, to photographers losing staff positions en masse, as we saw in Chicago. Yep. So these are issues that I deal with on a daily basis uh, from early in the morning to late at night. And the advocacy efforts that NPPA has made and continues to make um, really is worth the price of membership itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are many other organizations that charge three times as much as we do. Yep. Uh, We provide uh, a magazine. uh, A wonderful magazine, too, a monthly magazine. For those of you who remember Life, it's about as close to Life magazine with stories uh, dealing with issues uh, relating to our profession uh, every month, pretty much. As well as contests. Uh, they, they, you, you guys feature beautiful stories from photographers. We've got great members. contests. We've got, uh, uh, you know, BOP. Which is uh, coming up. I'm, I'm well, hopefully we, we'll post this uh, podcast pretty soon, but Best of Photography uh, contest is coming up at the end of the, is the, well, I mean, the deadline's the end of this month, January. Yeah, so it's open for entry. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do uh, video workshops. Mm-hmm. We do immersion courses up at Syracuse uh, for those interested in learning how to transition from shooting stills to shooting video and storytelling. The Northern Short course uh, every year this year, it's it's going to be down, uh, I believe, in Virginia. So, you know, I know I hear a lot from photographers, I don't have the money, Uh, I can't afford it. Uh, my position is that you can't afford not to be a member of NPPA because mm-hmm. nobody really cares what I have to say or what I have to write, except for the fact that I am representing uh, a large group of professional uh, visual journalists. And imagine how much more impactful that would be if the number was greater. Right. You know, think about the National Rifle Association how many members they have, what a force they are to be reckoned with. I mean, some of the things we've been doing now, obviously one of the big issues is the use of drones for journalism. Drones are big Uh, now. I have a meeting tomorrow uh, with uh, House and Senate staff that have the oversight over the FAA. We've been meeting with the FAA. We've been, we did a survey, a one of its kind survey on the use of of drones for news gathering. Mm -hmm. And I know that the people in the uh, SUAS, the small unmanned aerial system community, uh, dislike the word drones as much as I dislike the word paparazzi. Mm -hmm. But but the point is, it's it's here to stay, and we're not talking about the kind of 
predators that fly and are armed and are the size of, of, of small airliners. We're talking about devices that SUAS is defined as anything under 55 pounds. There's actually pounds. one right over your shoulder here. One, right over my shoulder. You switch shoulder. it back. It's, it's in the, um, well, it's behind in the, in the case here if we were talking about the drones. But, uh, but there's just been a recent petition filed uh, to actually re have some rules for uh, MUAS, micro drones, anything pretty much under, I think it's 10 pounds. It could be closer to three. Mm -hmm. um, so these are just another, I see, as another tool it's like deciding, do, you want, do I want to shoot this with a fisheye? Do I want to shoot this with a long lens? Do I need to get up in the air yeah. 50, 100 feet and be able to tell well, the story? We saw story. CNN's got this new drone system well, going. And, and CNN has, what's happened is the FAA, which pretty much says there's a ban on the commercial use of drones, and they deem anything that they have not authorized as a commercial use, including uh -huh. news gathering. And we've We've always argued that there's a very big distinction between commercial and editorial use. But, but that aside, they are woefully behind in their notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, we were told that that was going to be issued in December. And I kept saying, but what year? Uh, <laughs> right. So we're still waiting. Uh, in the meantime, they uh, authorized uh, six test sites throughout the country. And, and what uh, CNN did is um, they have an agreement uh, with a test site down in Georgia, and, and they're going to be testing there. Uh, NPPA is part of a media coalition uh, of a number of groups, the AP, New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, a, a number of uh, uh, large uh, television chains. And uh, we have also been uh, talking to the Mid-Atlantic test site, which is in Virginia, and we hope to be having an announcement uh, in the very near future where we will be doing the same kinds of things. I uh, proposed uh, some testing protocols that were accepted. Uh, so we've got some, some very real things to test. And, and, and we're trying to be good partners with the FAA. But unfortunately, you know, what we're seeing, what we're hearing in terms of requiring a private license, requiring a medical exam, requiring insurance, uh, at the rate as if you were operating a Cessna. Um, it's ridiculous. Uh, uh, you know, nobody's going to spend $800, $1,500 on, on one of these devices and then spend the time and upwards of $30,000 to meet those requirements. And unfortunately, I believe if we end up at the end of the day seeing these burdensome rules mm -hmm. come out of the FAA, we're going to be in no better place than we are now, which is a free-for-all, where everybody's just taking their chances, and it's catch me if you can, go fly it. Um, and, and what we are proposing is something more like a driver's license. Mm -hmm. You take a written exam. You take a road test, as mm -hmm. it were. You need to show that you can proficiently fly one of these. Um, you only can operate certain... Uh, uh, platforms, mm -hmm. just like you can't put any vehicle out on the road, it's got to be approved by the Department of Transportation. The FAA can say, look, DJI Phantom is one of them, for example. Right, right. Uh, and then you have to show a minimal insurance. And I think if they do that, people will be lined up around yeah, the block. Yeah, and, and I think that there is some licensed. reasonable uh, precautions that photographers should take, like insurance. If that thing fell on a crowd and knocked someone out or killed someone, for God's sake. Uh, there needs to be protections put into place for sure for the public. And and there will always be um, a people that are, you know, wrongdoers, the outliers. Yeah, yeah. You know, people drive cars without insurance. People drive uninspected, uninsured vehicles. We don't ban driving. Right. Um, so, you know, we will deal with those issues. So this is just a the, the peak of the iceberg or the tip of the iceberg that, that we're going to talk about with MPPA. Um, before we move forward, I just wanted to give a few shout outs, a big thank you to Adorama and their event space, which we're sitting in right now, which is just it's a great beautiful, space, beautiful space that they've reconverted um, for, for professionals and for events and all sorts of cool things. So if you want to see the type of events that go on, including the photo brigade uh, meetup, which we do at the usually the end of each month, you can follow us on uh, photo brigade, photo brigade on all social media as well as check adorama.com slash events to see what other cool events are being held here. Um, additionally, thanks to Tenba Bags, as always, for being such a supporter of everything we do, and to Rode Microphones for 
giving us these beautiful microphones, making sound our great. voices sound yeah. amazing. I sound a lot better than I usually I know, do. it's deceiving. Um, and then lastly, I think that we'll probably talk a little bit about it, but, uh, you know, shout out to photoshelter.com. They're, uh, you know, really great when it comes to um, protecting your work, archiving your work, and so on. So we'll get, we'll get more into that. And then before we also get into uh, more about the NPPA and what you do, I want to bring up that you know, you yourself, you're not just a lawyer, you, you've been a photographer, a videographer for many, many years. And, uh, you know, once once upon a time, you were a, a handsome young man with an afro. Exactly. And, and I thought I'd bring that up. Just Where just, did that guy go? Well, well, you put it on Facebook. So now now it's uh, now it's up yeah. here. So anyway, um, yeah, but, I, I, I worked in print and broadcast for about 40 years and then decided to, to go back to law school. So this is uh, for me, it's a labor of love. It's a way of giving back. Uh, the nice thing is that most uh, challenge for, for most lawyers is understanding what it is their clients do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think having done it for so long, I, I have that understanding. Uh-huh. And um, I'm just very passionate, if you can't tell, about how important it is uh, that we're able to continue as a profession because I, I think that even though everybody's got a camera these days and there's all this user-generated content and, you know, the last count I looked, 450 million images are uploaded to Facebook every day, just Facebook. Uh And that was a number from probably a year ago, so God knows what it is now. There is no substitute for what we do. Right. Uh, uh, You know, a part of being an NPPA member is uh, agreeing to abide by our code of ethics. Yes. Uh, and, and that's very important. And in, in this age of uh, a Photoshop, uh, you know, there used to be a, an old saying, uh, seeing is believing. Right. Whereas don't believe everything you read, but seeing is believing. And unfortunately, that's not necessarily true anymore. Mm-hmm. And, and we have seen time and time again unethical people manipulating images um, uh, just recently, I mean, even in terms of uh, the whole free press issue, uh, when they had the uh, "We Are Charlie" march uh, with all the world leaders, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, uh, an, an Israeli magazine took the women out because of a religious reason. A reason. I mean, that's something that you really want to be able to look at an image and believe that that's exactly uh, what it is depicting what right. really happened. Right. Um, okay, so let's jump into uh, First Amendment. Let's jump into copyright. Sure. Because um, it's, a, it's a big topic for, uh, on, on multiple levels uh, for photographers because there's so many ways that you can be infringed upon. And in this world of social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, sure. you name it, um, there's so many ways that photographers could be putting themselves at risk. And, um, yeah, so anyhow, what's the latest? I mean, uh, what's the latest with copyright? But, I mean, one of the things you always say is it's complicated. It's complicated, yes. But, well, 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 let's, if you don't mind, let's back up to to the the beginning, the access issue. First Amendment. And people always look at me and say, well, it's got a lot of clauses in it. You know, there's a religion clause and the right to assembly. But there's also two other clauses that that are pertinent to our discussion here. The one is, first one is free speech, the other one is free press. And that the government shall not abridge those rights. Mm -hmm. And by extension, the government, you know, it was Congress, then it was the federal government. It's been applied through the 14th Amendment to all state governments, municipalities, Mm -hmm. police, and then that implies to law enforcement because Mm -hmm. they are agents of the government. So, I said speech, I said press. Well, what has that got to do with photography? Through case law, photography has been deemed uh, to be a form of expression. Mm -hmm. And expression is a form of speech, and that's how it's protected. But as I do in my training, and just, again, I spend a lot of time talking to citizens, talking to journalists, but I found early on that it really didn't matter very much if citizens or journalists knew what their rights were. Mm -hmm. if the police didn't know or respect those rights. So I have spent quite a good deal of time doing training around the country with police agencies. Mm -hmm. Uh, Most recently, I did one in Dallas with about 150 police officers from Dallas, the Texas Rangers, the Texas Highway Patrol. 
Um, How did they take to you? Uh, at first, as as has been in in all the places that I've been, uh, they're they're pretty circumspect. Who is this guy, and why am I going to be sitting here for a few hours wasting my time? Mm-hmm. And by the end, they get it. They mm-hmm. really do get it. It's all about the fact that what we're talking about is the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, that they all took an oath to uphold. Mm-hmm. This is not some highfalutin idea. It's what makes this country great. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that said, the First Amendment is not absolute. It's subject to reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. Mm-hmm. And further, those restrictions must be content neutral. They must uh, leave open uh, alternate avenues of expression. And they must serve a significant government interest. And if they do that, then there's a likelihood that whatever law uh, restricts or abridges some of those First Amendment rights might be found to be constitutional. But for the most part, what we're seeing is uh, unconstitutional and unwarranted interference and arrests of of people out in public, whether they be citizens or journalists, uh, photographing and recording, uh, police performing their official duties in a public place. And not even police. Talking about people trying to take a picture of a building from a public place and say, "Uh, you can't take any pictures here. And And that's just wrong. If you're out in a traditional public forum, a sidewalk, a park, and you can see something and observe it. You can take a picture of it. You can record it. Now, it doesn't mean you can block up the whole sidewalk uh, because and New York has a, a film commission and they've, mm-hmm. yep. they've set up rules. But we, we even weighed in on those because those rules, when they were originally proposed, um, were far too restrictive mm-hmm. in terms of requiring a permit. And so they backed off on that. I see. Um, and, uh, and, and so pretty much you're free to do what you want on a public street. And, 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 and as, uh, the, the first circuit court of us court of appeals, uh, said, and I, I like this, the rights of the press and the public are coextensive so that if you have a DCPI, uh, depart, uh, um, deputy commissioner for public information, and they're the ones that issue the New York city, um, police press passes, mm-hmm. Um, that may let you get into a press conference where you've got a small room and they got to figure out we can't let everybody in. Right. When you're out on the street and you're taking a picture, you don't need a press credential. That's that's an interesting thing you say. As, as but a, we see it all the time. As a photographer, I when I used to work more breaking news and stuff, I used to get the DCPI press pass. And then at some point, I, I stopped because I never was asked to see it ever. I've been to all sorts of uh, different events, even photographed uh, President Bush when he came into... I don't know, it was the Bronx for something. And no one asked to see a DCPI press card. You know, I just showed him my license. It, it, it wasn't a big deal. So it's, it's important to know that not, you don't have to apply for, for a police-issued press pass in order to take pictures wherever you want. As a matter of fact, sometimes, unfortunately, having one can be a detriment. Where, oh, you were at the press? Uh, you have to be over there. You have to be in the press pen. You have to be mm-hmm. down the block. Mm-hmm. You have a long lens. Right. You can shoot from right. there. And then they'll let the general public mm-hmm. uh, even closer. So... So that's just something important to know. But once again, you can know all these rights cold. Police can be 100% wrong. Mm -hmm. At that point in time, you're going to lose the argument. Yeah. And they're the the authority figure. There are no good pictures to be had with your hands handcuffed behind your back in a patrol car. Yeah. They just, just, just aren't. Yeah. So that's a very personal thing as to whether or not, where you draw the line between am I going to get arrested that day? And sometimes it comes without warning. Sometimes there's a discussion. You need to move back. You need to go. And sometimes one minute you're shooting, and the next minute you're down on the ground right. being told you're under arrest. Right. And, uh, and uh, there, there's no, no in-between. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, uh, in New York in particular, um, in 1977, this is nothing new. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, New York Civil Liberties Union sued the New York City Police Department because photographers were being interfered with and arrested. Mm-hmm. And they entered into a consent degree, decree, whereby one of the things that was said is that photographing, taking pictures of police officers, if you're not physically interfering, if you're just standing there, minding your own business, keeping your mouth shut, taking pictures, mm-hmm. uh, does not constitute 
obstruction of governmental administration, which is the usual, what I call, catch and release charge that you get charged with, uh, besides disorderly conduct. Uh And in, in, uh, I think it was 1999, that was incorporated verbatim into the NYPD patrol guide. And it says that. And yet we still see time and time again people being charged with that charge for doing nothing more than do you think it's it's because that these uh, police officers are not educated properly that they're not being told the right thing or do you think that that these officers some of them that are giving people a hard time for shooting a building or a bridge or whatever it is are told to do exactly that like is it coming from above or is it just ignorance on the police officers there is no substitute for training you know police officers need to train with their firearms Police officers need to go through training, and they need to go through it on an ongoing basis. Not when you come through the academy. You learn it for you know, once, very minimally. Oh, yeah, there's a First Amendment next. Oh, yeah, there's a First uh, Amendment. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the problem that I find far too often is that it's the because I said so, mm-hmm. which works great for your mother. But other than that, a police officer cannot order you to do or not do something unless there's some basis in law. And then they certainly can't arrest you for defying that unlawful order. Mm -hmm. But it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, again, as I say in my training with officers, we can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way. The easy way is for them to learn and respect what those rights are. The hard way is getting sued problem is that it doesn't cause them that much money if any right, right. you know they may lose a few days pay may uh, <laughs> maybe yeah but they're gonna most, get they're most, gonna get paid to go one to the of the most and... recent settlements we just had w- this past june we had a photographer phil Datz, who was shooting for nbc out in suffolk county and he got arrested structured governmental administration took his camera they dropped the charges fortunately but after that, we brought a uh, federal civil rights lawsuit along with uh, the, the law firm of Davis Wright Tremaine and the New York Civil Liberties Union. We just settled that case in June for $200,000. Wow. $200,000 of taxpayer money that could have gone for other things. Right. Just because this sergeant, who a supervisory officer, for 30 years, he claims, should have known better. Right. Uh, but he didn't. And uh, aside from that, we we got them to issue new guidelines, to issue yearly training, to set up a a committee, uh, a police press uh, committee to talk about these things. Those are the kinds of things that we need. Uh, We just had another recent incident. People were paying attention over in Lacey, New Jersey, where a photographer was out. He was recording uh, an accident. It was an officer-involved accident, which usually raises their... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, protection. So a lot of officers will come up to photographers and say, if that was your mother, if that was your brother, would you want their picture in the paper? Would you be on TV? And, and I assert, and I tell them all the time, that's not your job. Yeah. Your job is public safety, collect evidence, preserve crime scenes. Not, it's not, not to determine whose picture gets taken and whose picture doesn't get taken. Not to be the, the PR rep for... So, yeah. uh, well, not to be the PR rep for the, and, the person. And, and that sensibility gets raised even higher when there's another officer involved understandable human nature but wrong mm-hmm. so so this case in in Lacey, uh you know the officer came over and said i i need your images i need that camera and he said he knew his rights he said hey i'll give you a copy of it but you can't have the camera officer and he recorded all this and he said it's not up for negotiate i'm not negotiating with you and he eventually arrested him uh the prosecutor there uh to his credit immediately said The officer was wrong. We're dropping the charges. We became involved. I've had discussions with them, and hopefully we'll have a a good resolution to this. But you need to have guidelines, and you need to have training, and it needs to be ongoing. And And then if people don't follow the guidelines and don't adhere to the training, then you need appropriate discipline. Mm -hmm. Uh, We had a case, another case in New York, Robert Stolarik, who works for the New York Times. Yep, I remember this. Who, who got arrested. They took his cameras. They took his press credential. Uh, I got involved in that case. Got him his cameras back. 
got him his credential back the day before he was leaving to cover the Republican convention in Tampa, and that was his only credential. He needed it to work. But we kept going round and round on this. Mm -hmm. Again, charged with obstruction of governmental administration. And then the officer decided to get cute. Uh, in the misdemeanor complaint, he stated the obstruction was not so much taking the pictures, but that Robert was firing his flash off in his eyes. Yeah, right. And that was causing him not to be able to do his job. Mm -hmm. So only, you know, a few small problems with that. When they seized his equipment and they inventoried it, guess what wasn't in the inventory? Probably a flash. A flash. <laughs> Next problem was uh, Robert had turned over to internal affairs uh, every frame that he shot that night. And as you know, if you look in the metadata, there's a field that says flash exposure. None. No flash. <laughs> yeah. And the other problem was that Robert doesn't own a flash. Right. <laughs> well, it took a while to get those charges dismissed up in the Bronx, but, but we, we got them dismissed. And then the district attorney wasn't very happy about mm -hmm. that because when an officer signs that misdemeanor complaint, it says under penalty of perjury. So, so that's, that's just only So proves. they convened the grand jury and they indicted him. Wow. And the trial is still pending. So, you know, that's a rare case. That, right. that, that doesn't happen too often, but it shows you what happens when you lie. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and so, you're, so as, as the lawyer for NPPA, you were, were able to help these folks out. Uh, can, you, can you sort of explain, I mean, obviously anybody can get their own lawyer. You don't necessarily represent the individual photographers, but you represent the organization. A a absolutely. You know, I, I, I'm not licensed to practice law in all 50 states, and I get calls from as far away as Hawaii, where I actually went and testified in a case uh, at, at their expense as uh -huh. an expert witness. Uh -huh. But um, for the most part, I try and give people general direction about what they can do, whether it's an access issue, it's a copyright issue, it's a social media issue, it's a contract issue. You know, I tell them they need to consult eventually with their own lawyer, just like we hate it. When, oh, my, my cousin can take pictures. It's like we're professional photographers. Your cousin might take pictures, but you get what you pay for. Right. The same thing here. You know, if you want a legal concert, consultation specifically tailored to your needs, you need to talk to a lawyer. Mm -hmm. You need to have them review contracts. You need to have them review agreements if you're making those to make sure that you've got everything in there that you need in there to protect yourself. Um, many times in, in, the, in the Phil Dad's case, uh, I will, because of the contacts that I have made uh, through the, the media law uh, committees that I'm on and participate in, I can reach out to lawyers. I can reach out to the ACLU and, 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 and talk to them about taking a case that they might not otherwise take. And many of them do it on a pro bono basis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are all the ways that we can be helpful. And I'm just always surprised um, how, unfortunately, uninformed a lot of photographers are. You know, did you get it in writing? Well, well, no. Well, that's really important because, you know, you want to avoid the he said, she said. Where can we go to get the, as photographers ourselves, get the most information? Would it be NPPA.org to, to, to yeah, get this NPPA.org. Uh, we've got an advocacy page. We've got a Know Your Rights page. We've got a whole bunch of things uh, that, that are going on. Um, and um, there's the advocacy button. Sorry, advocacy That's button right down here. Right there. Click on that puppy there. And then if you scroll down, there's copyright protection and resources, drone use for news gathering. Um, there's a whole bunch of things. And, uh, you know, cameras in the courtroom, federal shield law. Uh, media access to government, know your rights. That's uh, got a, got a lot a of information right on it. Yep. Uh, with lots of links. Uh, so NPPA.org is a great a great resource it, for information. It, it, it on absolutely all is. And then you know, as I tell people, you can always call me. You know, for a hundred and ten dollar membership, see how much a consultation, an hour consultation with a lawyer, will cost you. And that's for so, sure. So, and you're getting a whole lot more than than talking to me. Right. And um, I, I try and be as helpful as I can. Right. Um, okay. So one of the things that uh, well, we we actually went went back and, and started talking about other things, but uh, get back to uh, sort of the copyright since we were just talking about copyright here. Um, I know I've been. I know that other people, other photographers of my friends of mine, have been you know royally ripped off in, in big ways uh, through uh, infringement. Um, 
I don't even know know where to start on it because it's very complicated. Where I will start is um, register. I can't say it enough. People need to register their images with the Copyright Office. If your image is not registered with the Copyright Office, you cut yourself off from statutory remedies, uh, and, and that's really critical. And, and I'll, I'll try and explain that as best I can because it, it is complicated. So you can batch register your images uh, if in your workflow uh, you can identi put a unique identifier, whether it's some type of date or something you know, with incremental numbers. You can batch register thousands of images, unpublished images, for one price mm -hmm. of $35. And the thing about it is that you can do it with a three-month look-back period. So that if I take picture on day one, and on day two somebody infringes it, and within that three months I am able to register that image, I get copyright protection back to the day that I took it. And so there are photographers that every quarter, every three months, and don't wait for the very last day. They sit down and they batch register their images. It's part of what they do. Part of their workflow, yeah. Part of their workflow. And you get that copyright registration form. And when you have that, if somebody infringes on your image, if you are able to show that when you send a cease and desist or you send an invoice and you send the takedown letter and you show that, most lawyers... If somebody now says, oh, I just got sued for copyright infringement, as soon as they see that, they will say, oh, crap. Pay, the yeah. pay the invoice. Now, that doesn't mean because somebody infringed on your image, you just won the lottery. Don't have visions of sugar plums dancing in your head. I mean, it means that if you think about it, had they come to you and said, I'd like to license this image, how much? Well, you figure out what's it going to be used for. You come to a number. Let's just say it's $300. So they didn't ask. And they used it without permission. So triple it. You know, there's a penalty for not. But keep it reasonable. Don't say, I want $5,000. Because, you know, unless it's something very unique, you're not going to get it. Mm -hmm. And it's going to cost you a whole lot more. If That's the other problem. If you go to a copyright attorney, he's going to ask generally for a $10,000 retainer because it's very problematic bringing one of these cases. The only place you can bring a copyright infringement suit is U.S. federal court because copyright law is a federal law. Mm -hmm. You can't go to small claims court in the state. You can't go to, you can try filing in the state. You'll end up getting it removed to federal court. Now, that's another thing that NPPA was very instrumental and in. we believe that uh, and we advocated for and filed comments with the Copyright Office for a small claims tribunal whereby you can, it makes no sense. I want $600 for an image. I'm going to pay $10,000 to an attorney with no guarantee I'm going to get the $600. Mm, doesn't sound like a very good deal. And the problem is that people that infringe with impunity know that. They, they know that. I mean, I just, I have this iconic image of the Blizzard of 77 that mm -hmm. I shot for Time Magazine. And uh, I, I uh, actually uh, re-registered the image because it was a different copyright law and it, the copyright had expired after 28 years. And every once in a while, I don't do it with a lot of my images, but that one, I'll do the image search and I found some people and I sent them the letter and here's the registration form and this is what I want and you know they tried to negotiate and I was willing to negotiate a little I said but you know it's going to cost I'm an attorney I get the file on my own it's not going to cost me the $10,000 but it's going to cost you far more than the invoice yeah, yeah. to defend this so they pay but again if it was just that's my picture yeah is it, do you have the do you have the was it registered it, if it's not registered, that's the other thing is even if it's not registered, you can't even bring a copyright infringement claim in federal court until you register the image. Now, if you register the image after the infringement, you still don't get the statutory damages. Right, right. And by statutory, I mean 
for an infringement, it can go the, the range is seven fifty to thirty thousand dollars. That's for unwillful. That's willful is one hundred and fifty thousand dollars uh, per image. Per image, up to one hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollars. Now, most judges are not jumping at giving one hundred and fifty thousand dollars per image because they can't get their heads around the value of an image. Right. But uh, the, the, the the really important thing is that. Registering before the infringement also entitles you to attorney's fees, which in many cases can far exceed the damages you recover. Mm -hmm. So if, let's say, you're willing to pay the $10,000 for the retainer and you win the case and it's a strong case, the judge still has discretion but can grant attorney's fees. So you can get reimbursed for that. So let's say you collected $1,000 for the image and you also get the $10,000 back for what it costs to pay your attorney. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, another perfect example of that is, is the Morell case, if you're all familiar with, with that case where uh, Mr. Morell was a photojournalist in Haiti, and he was there during the earthquake, and he was the only one to get the first pictures, and he pushed them out on Twitter and TwitPic, and they got Because picked. that was the only way he that could get the them was the only out. way. I mean, this was... I mean, in Haiti, the infrastructure is almost non-existent. After the earthquake, finding electricity and finding internet was almost impossible. But he managed to do it, and he got eight images out. And, and unfortunately, uh, AFP, Agence France Press, picked them up and started distributing them to complicate matters. Another photographer uh, had seen them and started putting them out as his own with his name on it. Goodness. It became a mess. Yeah. But remember what I said about that look back. So he's down in Haiti. He's trying to get them to stop. Uh, They're going through all that. In the meantime, everybody out Getty's picking them up, Washington Post, CNN. Everybody's like, these are the first images. They were on almost every front page of every newspaper in the world. Because people are still trying to get into Haiti while he's pushing these pictures out. Well, he ends up registering within that three-month look back. He's got the copyright protection. Unfortunately, you know, throwing gasoline and adding insult to injury, AFP actually sued him and sought a declaratory judgment that he wasn't entitled uh, to the, the copyright claim, that the terms of service of Twitter and TwitPic allowed them to use those images. And what they said, what the terms of service really say, is that in very plain language, what's yours is yours. You're giving... Uh, them, Twitter and TwitPic, the right to use those for promotional purposes to say, hey, these images were first came out of Haiti through our service. Mm-hmm. They can do that. But a third party can't do that. And the first judge in that case said, sorry, what's yours is yours. That was pretty cl- plain. You lose. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, obviously, Mr. Morrell counterclaimed for willful infringement. Uh, because those images continue to be out there even after he told them to take them down. And they appeal that decision, AFP and Getty, and, uh, and, and a number of other defendants, like I said, the Washington Post and CNN and ABC and a whole ton of them. And the second judge basically said, which part of what the first judge said didn't you guys understand? And the, and the, ca- and the case continued. And for lots of reasons, it should have settled, but it didn't settle. Almost every defendant in that case, except for Getty and AFP, settled. Well, I think it's interesting to, to, to maybe point out also that um, there are serial infringers. You yes, know? absolutely. Uh, and, and Pirates. This was a very unique instance, obviously, and those people were in the wrong, and they paid for it, clearly. And, 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 and I sat in during the trial. This was a jury trial. This, this went to the damages. Mm-hmm. And so there are eight images at 150000 an image. The jury awarded him the $1.2 million, and then there's some other DMCA copyright violations. I watched that jury. I guarantee had the limit of $150,000, the cap per willful, they would have given him more money. And, you know, he's applied for attorney's fees, and I believe those attorney's fees will be granted. And they will, again, maybe not dwarf by a lot, but they will far exceed the damages in the terms of the cost of that litigation. Mm-hmm. Uh, not to mention the cost on the other side, I mean, to, to, to Getty and, and AFP in terms of the, the, the battery of lawyers that they had. Now, they probably had insurance paying for that, but, you know, it, still, right. you know, it wouldn't surprise me if the legal fees on that side were $10 million. 
So, so you, so you talk about exactly attorneys' fees, but you talk about people that that are serial infringers, people that that regularly do this. Well, and, and I would not categorize. I wouldn't categorize them Getty exactly. Or any so, what I was those. saying is that that's a no, separate no, there instance. There are people that go out there and they just take what they want. But whether it's mom and pop, uh, who don't know better, unfortunately. There are far too many people that think that the internet is the public domain. The public domain is a legal term of art, meaning whatever the work is is no longer protected by copyright, either because the person didn't copyright it, because the time has passed, uh, and, and, and it moves into the public domain. But the bottom line is images on the internet were created by someone, and when according to copyright law, when that image was fixed in a tangible form, whether it's film or digital or whatever, copyright attaches. So you have the copyright. There's a difference between the registration, but you still immediately own the copyright, and this is where it gets complicated, unless it's a work for hire, which again is a very specific term that needs to be articulated. If somebody hires you and says this is a work for hire, the, the little red flags need to go up because that basically means they own the copyright to that. If you're an employee and you're employed and you're being paid a salary and given benefits, um, unless there's a separate uh, agreement, they own the copyright to the images that you take for them while you're working for them. And some of them may extend it to, they own all your images. I, I think that would be wrong. If you're on your own time, the copyright should vest with you. So. Those are all things that, that people really need to be aware of. But the real problem is that there are far too many people. It's, you know, they, it's right-click on wild. And people just, just see what they want. They save as. They use it. They post it. They figure nobody's going to find me. If out of 100 infringements, 98 of them will go unnoticed. Two people may come forward. One of them will, you know, maybe pay pennies on the dollar or just say go away or sue us. Uh, and so it's their cost of doing business, and it's very profitable because they're making money off of other people's work. It is interesting, and, and you, and you the, 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 like I was saying, the serial infringers, they will go on a, on a big defense trying to, you know, knock down your, your registration, trying to just... Uh, prolong, or just or just ignore you or ignore you but I mean even once you once I've heard many cases you know they'll go to court and it'll take years you know they'll keep putting in motions to delay trying to you know make the photographer pay more and, money and that's and why having fees. a small claims copyright tribunal which by the way the copy US copyright office back in September of uh, last year I can't or we third, discussed I this think briefly it was yeah they absolutely came out. And, and were very supportive of it. And a 200-page report that they issued, uh, absolutely were supportive of it. But that has to be an act of Congress, which, unfortunately, we've got a Congress that can't agree as to whether it's daytime or nighttime outside. So even though there have been many hearings uh, that I have attended you know, on behalf of NPPA and submitted testimony to and been very involved with in terms of the next great copyright act, it's going to be it's going to be a while in the making. I mean, people I don't think realize that the Copyright Act from the 70s actually they started working on that in the 50s. So we ended up with 1950s type copyright law in the mid 70s. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, as technology expands at this amazing exponential rate, what I fear is you know they're starting now in 2014. And you know, maybe by 2020, we'll end up with 2014 copyright law, and who knows what things will look like by then. Yeah. Here's a question for you. So um, earlier, you mentioned the the whole retroactive situation, where you know the first uh, 90 the, the days, the look back, the yeah. look back. That's that's when you first take the photo. You have that time. One thing that I I guess that you know I've only recently really learned, and I didn't realize it because it's complicated. Um, is that you can register your, your photos at any time, but they're only registered from that point forward. Is that correct? Again, it's published, and, and this is a real problem we've been dealing, trying to deal with with the Copyright Office, is published and unpublished. If it's a published image, those usually need to be registered individually. Ah, okay. Uh, if they're unpublished, they can be batch registered, and we're trying to figure out a way how to batch register or published published. Photos try to figure out a way how we can mix published and unpublished. It's just, it's, it's a problem. But 
but we're but we're there working on it, and I, we're, we're we meet with the copyright office, and, and along with other photo associations, we have these meetings. We're part of a copyright alliance. Uh, we're part, part of NPPA is part of a copyright society. Uh, we are all trying to work together as best we can to advance the interests of photographers because, you know, I can get people all the access in the world, but if you can't afford to earn a living by the pictures you produce, you're going to go do something else because why go through all the hassle? And, and as I said, I think the world will be a lesser place for not having these compelling images that, that we make on a daily basis. All right. Well, that's, register your photos so that you can uh, uh, you know, get into And the one other thing I just want to talk about that becomes this other ongoing problem is fair use. Oh, yeah. Uh, people are always <laughs> claiming fair use. Fair use is a defense to copyright infringement. So the way it's supposed to work is this. Somebody infringes your work you file for copyright infringement. In their answer, they assert fair use. And, fi and then the court decides, is it fair use, isn't it fair use? Unfortunately, it's become a buzzword. Mm -hmm. I call it the FU defense, because that's what people basically say when you call them up and say, hey, use my picture, fair use, bye, FU. <laughs> um, and, and, and the court uses four factors to determine that fair use. And they're all supposed to be balanced. The problem is that one of this, another buzzword is transformativeness. And this happened in the Carew case. Uh, uh, if people are familiar with it, Carew uh, uh, v. Prince, uh, Mr. Carew, Patrick Carew, was a a fine arts photographer who took pictures of Rastafarians in Jamaica, and he did a book, fine arts book. And then uh, Richard Prince, who calls himself an appropriation artist, I call him a misappropriation artist, <laughs> he took those images and he did some very minuscule things, you know, some might even call them childlike, kindergartners could do the same. <laughs> and he made big blow-ups, and he sold them at galleries for tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And Mr. Carew sued for copyright infringement. And the judge in that case, they were, there were 30 images in question. The judge in that case, in the original trial court, federal court, found that indeed these images were infringing and actually ordered the artwork that Mr. Prince had created to be destroyed. Hmm. They appealed to the Second Circuit, who came out with this fair use, nonsensical, I believe, ruling. And to the point that the, the, the judges were applying their aesthetic values, which is something that Oliver Wendell Holmes stated a long time ago in the Supreme Court, that judges shouldn't do. And they found, believe it or not, 25 of the 30 images were fair use, and five of them they sent back for remand for further fact-finding. Hmm. If I show you the pictures, you will not, For the I've shown them to lots of people. Nobody can figure out which ones are the fair use and which ones are the unfair use, possibly. So on remand, uh, the NPPA, along with a number of other groups, filed an amicus brief, as did many galleries uh, in support of Mr. Prince. And... Uh, uh, they actually tried to appeal a case to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court refused to take it, and the case eventually settled for an undisclosed amount of money. But we're finding that this fair use is, rather than being the exception to the rule, is turning copyright into the exception to fair use. And that's something that we are very much, again, as groups and NPPA is, is, is very involved in leading the way in this and making sure that doesn't happen so that, so that the exception doesn't uh, subsume the rule. So let's transition to something that's a little bit more, uh, something, an issue that I just saw in the last week or two. I mentioned it in my last podcast, which I actually just published today. Um, but there's this fella in uh, Columbus, Ohio. I don't know if you saw this issue where he's being sued by a model because his photos, he claims, were stolen and then used by a, a pornography sort of situation. Um, how can a photographer protect themselves from that sort of situation? And 
I, I don't know. What are your feelings on this whole case in general? It's a difficult thing, obviously. It, it you know, it, it is, it, it's very difficult. It's very troublesome. Um, I think the big thing that people need to keep in mind is that you can shoot something for an editorial purpose. Remember going back to, you have a right to photograph and record on the street yeah, told, yeah, because yeah. there's no reasonable expectation of privacy in a public place. That's all well and good. Mm -hmm. But what you do with those images afterwards can get you in a whole lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you have to be aware of what's going on. So if you shoot something for an editorial purpose, the, the problem these days is it goes into this huge database of images at some organization. And even though the editorial side might see something, then, you know, uh, the advertising side sometimes is also able to see the same database. Ah, that's a great picture. And they just, everybody's in this, gotta have it now, you know? And they just take the image and next thing you know, it's being used for an advertisement. Well, now we got another story because is there a model release? Well, probably not because Shot most street yeah. photographers, editorial photographers, news photographers don't get or need model releases. Mm -hmm. But now it's being used for a whole different purpose. So now your picture's on the cover of a Wheaties box. And you go, I, I didn't give anybody permission to, to, to do that. I, I'm suing. Um, you know, and there are in different states... There are, you know, if the picture is, let's say, defamatory in some way. You know, the example I like to use is, so think about the news, and they are doing a story on either obesity or smoking. And they're shooting on a public street. Again, you have a right to do it. But what do they show? They usually show posteriors, low shots, tight shots of embers. Going. They don't show identifiable features because even though they have a right to do it, they're trying to be a little you know, circumspect. And rather than show somebody who says, you called me, you you put me in a story about fat people. You know, I, I'm embarrassed. And they, they sue for defamation, uh, for right of publicity, for whatever. So you need to be very aware. Just because you have a right to take a picture, got to be mindful of afterwards what might happen to it. So back to the database. So these pictures, they're out there. People find them. People, again, misappropriate them. You need to be very careful in your contracts with people and your agreements. Uh, just like if you see a clause in there, indemnify and hold harmless, where the company, if they get sued, has the right to come back to you and indemnify basically means insure. Mm. Uh, and so you'd be paying for their legal fees, and you'd be paying hold harmless. If there's damages found against them, they're going to come back to you and say, you pay the damages. It's your fault that this happened. Right. So you need to either make sure that that gets struck so you're not found, or that Mutual. Um, they mirror. Yeah, yeah. They mirror each other. The same thing happens for them. If through no fault of your own, those images get used because of something they did and you get sued, they need to indemnify and hold you harmless. And again, that, that another thing is insurance. You know, you need to have insurance. If somebody trips over one of your cables or a light falls on their head or anything, you need to have some type of liability insurance. And then the other thing is you need to think about incorporating because if you're just out there by yourself, your house, everything you own could eventually be found if you get a judgment against you that you'd have to sell all that uh, in order to satisfy the judgment. So it's not like, hey, you got a camera, let's go out and take some pictures and see what happens. Because in this case, we did see what happened. We did see, and, and although we haven't seen the, you know any kind of ruling, but right. we see that he's put in this position, whether he was is you know guilty or not for for whatever has happened. But is that something that uh, in a, like a model release you can you can have like a indemnification clause within? I mean, I don't know. I'm just thinking like, is it would it be then uh, you know is it the fault of of it's like who, I don't even know what, you, what to say in these sort of situations. Well, you know, it depends on how broad a model release you have. I mean, if you have like any and all medium worldwide, you know, for now known or unknown use. I mean, you see these things that yeah. try and project into the future. Um, I, I think the agreement probably should have. He should have probably had 
uh, maybe a better model release again. I, I you know, I that's without I, looking at it. We don't know. We looking don't know at it. I, and, I, and I, I hate to speculate. You know, and and whatever type of insurance, if if he didn't have any, he probably should have had some. Mm-hmm. And whatever the agreement was between him and the the agency that he was shooting for. Right. Right. So those are you know, it's a cautionary tale of you hate to hear these horror stories, yeah. but. It's what makes people wake up and say, "Oh my God, I, I need to, to to work on this." If you if you're trying to run a business, you're trying to make money, you're trying to be professional, then you need to do all of the things that one does. You know, I'm sure the store mm-hmm. has agreements and contracts and insurance and all of the things that it needs to have to protect itself. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and then uh, I'm not sure if there's anything that we haven't really discussed that you, that you want to throw out there. Because uh, all, obviously all this is important and there's, you know, we could I, talk for I, hours. I, yeah. I think another thing is uh, th- to think about is, is obviously social media. Oh, yeah. Social media. Social for sure. media and the terms of service, terms of use, whatever they want to call it. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody, again, is in a hurry. You find the radio button. I agree. Nobody reads it. And then it's, oh, my God. Uh, you know, they use my pictures. And, and, and the problem is this, is that many of the terms of service include a clause that says we can change the terms of service whenever we want. And Facebook used to have a thing where we'll post our change in terms of service. And if enough people say that, you know, they are concerned or they don't want it, uh, we won't do it. Mm-hmm. And that eventually evolved into they put in the terms of service that were taking out that clause mm-hmm. and not enough people did it. And now they are able to change the terms of service. So people need to be very aware of what it is they're agreeing to, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. You need to know, you need to go to those sections about privacy, about copyright, and read and understand what it is you are agreeing to when you agree to uh, these terms, yeah, to to those terms and and use their service, you know, some some places say when you take it down, everything's down. Others say you can take it down, you can close your account, but the images remain. And unfortunately, it creeps more and more. And and uh, you know what. Some of these sites looking to monetize on your, and I hate the word content, because I think it minimizes images. Mm -hmm. Content to me is what it says on a macaroni box. The content of this box may have settled. That's content. What we do is not just content. It's creative work. Um, And so you, you need to, you know, make that decision. Are... Uh, the terms of service so onerous that you're doing yourself a disservice by using that product. Right. Or, okay, I understand. I'm taking my chances and I'm willing to do it for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. But I can't stress enough, you need to read what it says and you need to be aware of it. There was just a recent case I posted out of Florida, mm-hmm. where and, and this has to do with privacy more than copyright. But this woman um, slept in a Target store, and she hurt herself. She claimed she hurt herself, and she sued Target. And Target went on her Facebook page. Oh right! And they saw images of her partying and carrying things and doing all the right, stuff right, that right, she right. said she could no longer do. So in discovery, because that's one of the things that happens, though each side asks for information, information yeah. and material, they ask for pictures. And she ended up deleting them all and saying, I have my, my uh, privacy, it's set to private, only to my friends, so you're not entitled to them. Hmm. And they went to court, and basically the court said, no. You know, you can have what you, you're putting stuff out for people to see, whether they're your friends. And the problem is, if friends of them don't have privacy and it becomes public, it's just, it's out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, there's ways for it to so be seen. So mm-hmm. those are things people need to be aware of, even pictures now. You can post a picture 
and have your privacy settings that only your friends can see those. But if one of those friends shares that picture with somebody else who doesn't have those privacy settings set to private and has them set to public, that picture becomes public. It, it's it's really an interesting sort of uh, situation, uh, Facebook and everything. I, I know I know that um, we have here's some more water for you. Um, I know that we have uh, various settings we can do and 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 things. And obviously, Facebook is a is a tool. I know. I mean, I know for instance, you are on Facebook and use it to to you know share advocacy issues and and things like that. I know that I post photos onto different social media networks. Um, one of the the more recent um, things I've been trying to do is making sure to at least watermark all of the photos that Absolutely. I put on, because um, you know at the very least you know if they're shared they'll have where it came from. Yeah, and and that's a problem with metadata. A lot of these sites strip out the metadata. So even if somebody wants to try and figure out whose picture it is, they can't. Uh, and that's a whole Orphan Works issue. You can, Orphan Works was envisioned as images that were taken so long ago that nobody knows or remembers or can find the person that created it. We have instant Orphan Works now. You pu- upload a picture to some of these sites, the metadata, if, even if you're good about filling it out, gets all stripped out. Right. And we've been trying to work with a number of these groups uh, to ensure that they will not do that. But the problem is, when metadata uploads, it slows down the upload. Oh. And everybody's into... So they want to just get everything up there as fast as they can. Unfortunately, that's the, the detriment. That's of, interesting. Of the so, do you think that that's the main the main reason why they're they've done this stripping, or do you think it's more legal? Like, well, we want to make sure any copyright notices or any kind of disclaimers are out of there. I, so I, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. I think it's the loading speed. Okay. And I'm sure that they've probably come up with a way to not have it slow down, and one would hope. But, you know, again, watermarking, great idea, easily done, part of the workflow. And if somebody uses the image and it's watermarked and they either cut off the watermark intentionally or use it anyway, that goes to proving willful infringement. Hey, don't tell me you didn't know whose picture this was. Right. Or you knew whose the picture was, and you intentionally cut off whose picture this was right. to show it as if it were your own, or that as if you had a license or permission to use it. And that, so that's another important uh, component to proving willfulness. Which only matters if you've registered your photos. Which only matters if you register your photos because you can't claim a willful infringement without it being registered prior to the infringement. So um, uh, one one thing I want to uh, mention, and, and I'll try to maybe put the YouTube video on our blog page for this, as well as maybe link to it right now, right here. <laughs> I'm giving my wife things to do in the post-production now. Um, but uh, John Harrington has a really nice YouTube video, which is, you know, it's long. It's probably like 45 minutes long. And John, it, it, one of our board members. Uh, and uh, he's Mr. Business of Photography. And he goes through the step-by-step process of what he does to register his images on a regular basis, um, you know, using the retroactive, uh, just, just he, he's, he's vigilant about it. And I actually was chatting with him the other day, and he mentioned to me, you know, I was talking to him about the nuance. And, and and whatever and, and he mentions how he, every single one of his registrations is like 28 pages long because he crams so many into it and he also um, you know does it so that he has a long history of registering in the copyright office because that means something if you if a lawyer tries to look and sees that I've only registered one photo versus hundreds of thousands of photos right. they would think that I probably got it right yeah so. these are all really important things there's lots of places, especially NPPA.org, to get information about how to register your images. Pretty much, you know, the one thing about the Internet, it's not the public domain, but you can pretty much, if you've got a question, if you ask it the right way, you will get an answer and you will get multiple ways of uh, getting information about doing just about anything. Uh, the U.S. Copyright Office uh, is a wonderful website and a wonderful resource, and they're not charging anybody anything, and they lay out out there uh, ways to do everything, mm-hmm. and you can call them. I mean, they are very helpful. Very, They'll very, respond by email. I mean, yeah. think about how many people must call them, but I cannot tell you in in registering that Blizzard image how helpful they were 
in, in working me through the process because it was a little more complicated because it was a re-registration. And there's also, like, everyone should know that, that yes, there's published and there's unpublished. And right. there's batch and there's no batch. But there's different ways that you really have to take in consideration how you register your photos. What kind of contract are you working under when you take that photo? Are you sharing that copyright with an entity? Absolutely. You know, that changes how you register that photo. Um, and that can come back and haunt you or, uh, in different ways. So you got to make sure you're doing it right. One of the things that I think is interesting, though, and I've heard in a number of cases, um, that if there is an issue, you know, someone shows that your registration is invalid, the court will ask the copyright office, well, what do you think about this yes, situation? What would, what would you do? Right. And, and most of the time, I think it's a precedent now that they would take it back and fix it. So, so even if you didn't do it perfectly, right. at they, least they, getting they, it registered. They have a way is, to cure it. Yeah. So, as I keep saying, it's, it's complicated. It's complicated. Well, um, um, I just, yeah. just, just one more thing, um, which is an, an interesting phenomenon. Again, social media. There have been a number of cases that I have watched where somebody has infringed on somebody else's work. Uh -huh. I'll give you the one. It's DKNY. People might remember this from a few years ago. So there was this uh, street artist, a uh, street photographer, who took lots of pictures, obviously didn't get model releases. Mm -hmm. His work came to the attention of DKNY. They asked him if he would be willing to provide images uh, to them for use uh, mm -hmm. in their stores. And um, there he is. they didn't have a meeting of the minds. They needed model releases. He didn't have them. They offered him whatever they offered him. He said no. Uh, you know, as Thomas Friedman said, the world is, fra is flat. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he thought they were done and no deal. Uh, a friend of his is walking down the street in Bangkok and goes by a DKNY store. And there in the front window of the store are all a montage, a wall full of oh his images. God. So he takes a picture the, with the mannequins in the front and the pictures in the back. And he sends it to the guy. The guy doesn't say I'm going to sue he doesn't do anything he goes on social media he posts this thing tweets about DKNY shows the picture and asks for $100,000 to be donated to the charity of his choice huh and so there's, there's all this back and forth the thing goes viral and within I think it was either a day or three days DKNY said will you take 25000 to the charity of your choice done <laughs> the power of social media yeah i guarantee a battery of lawyers it would have been years and hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars in legal fees to adjudicate that case which also then shows the power of social media which, in various ways as which well. shows the positive side of yeah. it yeah mm -hmm. there's another story with a color run a college student uh again oh yeah i remember this yeah. he uh took pictures uh they asked him if he'd do stuff for them he said basically only online, ends up seeing some of his images in the store. He goes, he, he kind of went overboard that whole visions of sugar plums, you know, and then made this outrageous demand. They went back and forth. The, the, the company dug in its heels. There's a lot of bad going back and forth, but the, you know, the, the, the running thread was with the photographer. And eventually the case settled and it was done, done amicably. Right. Uh, and, and again, within days as opposed to years in court. So that's important to, to keep in mind, too. Okay. Well, let me give a, a few more plugs. So NPPA, one thing we didn't mention is, at least at, at the time being, there's a, a certain deal that they've got going on, which is, uh, you know, helping to... to grow the membership students uh, forming student chapters getting other people to join getting a discount for that uh, you know and it's also something that is very important we need it, it's matching funds we get money uh, from an organization that uh, collects uh, fees for reprographic rights and then they distribute them to organizations and it's based on how many members we have so the more members we have, the more money we get, the more we're able to do. Uh, you know, it's kind I've of I've got one for you. I just remembered. I changed my Amazon account 
Am- smile.amazon.com. Yeah. And, and that benefits the National Press Photographers Foundation. If Oh, okay. But, so but, there's a little but bit of a difference there. It's a little bit of a difference. They're a 501c3. Uh-huh. You, money that gets contributed to them can be claimed as a tax deduction. We're a C6. It can't. We're still a nonprofit, but it works a different way. But, you know, whatever people can do to join, to support... Uh, we need to remain a viable organization, and as I said, uh, you know, we can we can all hang together. Well, I didn't say it. Ben Franklin said, it, but <laughs> "We can all hang together, or we can all hang separately." Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, if you're out there on your own, uh, trust me, it it, uh, it it doesn't work as well. The last example I'll give: we had the student. He had a picture on Facebook. Uh, from UNC, University of North Carolina. They used his image. He sent them a letter with an invoice. They basically said, we're not paying for it. We're sorry. You know, their attorney got involved and said some very nonsensical things. I sent him a letter. Guess what happened? Yeah. They paid him. That's right. The power of making. because well, it wasn't the it was, the power, it was the power of the, of the organization. Yeah, yeah, it was absolutely. the power of bad publicity. It was the power of the fact that when NPPA weighs in. Uh, news organizations pick up stories as opposed to a dispute between two people. Um, and and then you get all of the pressures that come to bear when there's press attention. So these are all reasons that I would hope people would be very proud to say that they are NPPA members. Absolutely. And, and there's also a referral link that people can use now to get, I think, more than 15% off their annual fee. If you refer, you also get... Uh, that off of your fee the next year so uh, you can you know we're not taking any of it but photo brigade you know use that code or you can use mickey's or any other standing members uh, uh, code to get a discount it's, on your it's membership under the just do one thing just so. do one thing get another friend to get involved with nppa and that'll be a, that's a big deal um other than that nppa.org make sure you get going there um, I mentioned we were going to talk about Photo Shelter as well, but we won't really. But they've got some really great copyright protection tools uh, that you guys should check out. Um, sure, avail yourself of whatever you have uh, that will work for you. Well, Mickey, I, I really appreciate you coming here. I know that you've got to get to court, go downtown right now. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you to Adorama, Road Microphone, Tenba, Photo Shelter, and uh, Mickey. And thank you. It was great, I'll, as always. I'll see you next time. It was lots of fun, and hopefully uh, people uh, got some information and enjoyed it, and they'll join NPPA. Join NPPA. Oh, yeah. Also, follow. Uh, you can follow Mickey on uh, Twitter, Twitter NPPA lawyer. Yeah, that's my Instagram my is the same. Or? I don't use Instagram oh, okay. oh, yeah. again, mm. terms of service, but that's something personal Good for you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and uh, there's and, some and, good resources and, and, and uh, Facebook, Facebook. He shares advocacy stuff. Follow us at photo brigade, Facebook, Twitter, and all the others. All right. Thank this you. Mickey. Great. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.